Yep, that looks good. Um, I don't know if you heard, but I had mentioned to Brian that when you do the screen share, if you're going to share audio, just make sure you clicked the share sound button. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Yeah, I can hear you. I meant on the video. If you have any videos. Oh no, I don't. Okay. I, I'm with you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, Brian, do you want to lead off and introduce your, yourself and me or something? Sure. I'll. I'll get it kicked off and then um, we're going to turn it over. This is, we're going to co-present um, back and forth here a little bit, but I, I appreciate everyone who's on here joining us for this overview of, of Listen and using bird songs to um, conduct research and share, share with students. Um, again, my name is Brian Keyes. I am a research associate at Michigan State University, uh, former college professor, had done administrative work in environmental organizations. And through all of that, um, I've really heard a lot from college students and others about the importance of experiences when they're young that kind of got them excited about environmental topics, um, whatever that ranges from. I've worked in aquatic systems, invertebrates, um, up to these birds and, and other types of animals. But lately, what I've been working on here at Michigan State is uh, opportunities to work with all ages of students, especially younger students, K to eight students, to be able to provide them opportunities to explore their natural environment and ask actual research questions that aren't sort of canned responses. Um, and so I will actually be presenting a separate project right after this one on moths. Uh, but this first one is kind of the brainchild of Dr. John Pickering, and he will kind of start off after his introduction with an overview of the website. And then I will come back in and share a little bit more about the, the education side of it. So over to you, Pick. Okay, I just put two links uh, in the chat. Uh, I would like to start... Uh, let me uh, uh sorry to interrupt i don't see the links oh, God. <laughs> sorry i put the gen the general link to oh, the, there the it is. website is the first there, one there's there's two sites okay so uh and what i want to uh talk about is, is a can you see this this is discoverlife.org www.discoverlife.org and there, rather than going to the chat, if you can just remember that, there, there's two things in here. The one we're talking about today is listen, but I also want to point you to lessons from Shoal Creek Sanctuary. So uh, I'm going to start with the overview of why we're going to do this, and then Brian's going to focus on the educational aspects of this. Uh, so basically uh, what happened, hang on, let me just... There we go okay uh so basically what uh, what's happened there's been a, a a huge decline in the number of birds across north america and there's also been a uh, people are describing it as the insect apocalypse and a decline in insects certainly in europe and if you drive a car around north america you're not going to get any bugs on your windshield so there's uh, this huge concern about uh, decline in biodiversity. And there's also uh, a thing saying that mammal populations in North America have gone down 50%. So we've we've got some uh, potentially horrendous or in places horrendous declines in bio, uh, uh, biodiversity. And what we're doing here is trying to figure out what the drivers of those are. Why, why have birds gone down? Why have insects gone down in some places? And so I'm saying in some places, because uh, the, the second thing, Lessons from Shoal Creek Sanctuary, that link, uh, tells of a uh, this a square kilometer of land that we've, we've got here that I own and manage. And we've been studying moths on it for every night, for pretty much every night, and got pushing 5,000 nights of data now on moths uh, in uh, on the sanctuary. And our numbers have gone up. Uh, they've gone up significantly, or 65% increase in moths, uh, beetles are up, caddisflies are up, mayflies are up. It, it, it's a 
a, a beautiful place for insects. And I've also started recording birds uh, a, a little over a year ago. And our birds seem healthy. I, from my deck, sitting on my uh, my uh, uh, back deck, I've recorded 134 species of birds in the past year, a little over a year. So what we can say is, well, there's a potential declines or there are declines in a lot of places around the world, but my place is fine or seems to be fine. And so the question is, can we figure out what the drivers are for bird decline? Uh, and the only way we can do this is by getting a large number of sites to start doing what are called natural experiments. So if we wanted to know what's the impact of drought on uh, insects, for example, it would be very difficult to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to dry this region or dry this state or dry these sites and you know wet other ones and so on. But you can, if you have enough sites and you me uh, measure the variables, you can then use natural experiments. Well, we had a drought in Georgia in 2007, uh, uh, or and we didn't have one here and so on, and we can do that. So what I've been trying to do is uh, find, for, this is actually for the last 30 years, I've been trying to find a means by which we can get people to collect standard data across large numbers of sites. And I've been very frustrated. I got this moth project going. I've taken half a million photographs of moths, but it's not something that everybody would want to do. I mean, you have to get up at four, four o'clock in the morning and you, it goes on and on and on. And it's very difficult to identify them. I've got over 1400 species of these moths. It's a great study, but it's not easy to replicate at many sites. Now, last, uh, last May, May 5th, I'm, I'm out there taking photographs of moths and I hear a turkey. And I go, oh, there's this app that Cornell's got. And people don't use it for monitoring, but they use it uh, for identifying a bird for educational purposes. And, oh, what's that bird? Well, I know it's a turkey. So I said, I wonder if uh, this Merlin app from Cornell, uh, which is a free app, can you use that uh, to, will it get this turkey? And lo and behold, it got the turkey immediately. And I was hooked. And so every day I've gone out there uh, for a year now and recorded these birds every morning. And I've come up with this protocol we're going to talk about today called Listen. And I just want to show you a few of, uh, a few of the results here. Because in setting up the uh, Cornell University and setting up uh, Merlin, one of their goals, one of the key goals is education, getting something that people can do that aren't bird watchers and they can get the birds. And it is a really utterly fantastic app. It uses AI to identify the birds. It's not right 100% of the time, but we've now tested it against you know professional birders, basically, or people really know what they're doing, and it matches them, or it's close, very, very close. So it's really, really good. And you can turn a six-year-old or a, you know, basically a blind person that's, uh, you know, 70 into an expert bird listener by pressing a button on the application, recording it. And we've come up with a simple protocol. We ideally want people to go out there early in the morning and record the birds uh, for 30 minutes. And we feel, and Brian will explain this, and Brian's been doing it in Michigan as well, and we've got a high school student that's done it. I want to show you the, the data of the type of things we're going to get. And then just sort of say, listen, this is a free app from Cornell. It's a free app to get the data in from uh, discover life and you will be able to uh, compare your you know if you did it for 30 students and you all have cell phones you could then have 30 sites and you can compare who's got the most birds and then you, we can start figuring out why and ultimately the, the, this has been designed so we can have at least 50,000 sites reporting data every day we've got uh, five servers uh, in Texas that do that so with no further to do I just want to show you the results and how listen works. Okay, so if you click on listen here uh, on the website, the, 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 there's the big questions is how we're gonna do this, our research protocol, join us, and there's some steps here that you can go through, and Brian may go through this more. And then you can click on get going here. If you wanna see my site, you can go to this one uh, here, 275 Blue Heron Drive, or you can go to 500 Horse Road, which is a high school, a uh, student that has been working on this, she's graduated, she's valedictorian of a class, and she uh, she's basically got well over 100 birds at her site as well. So the idea is you can get it, 
And what's absolutely fantastic about this is it's a standard method across sites that is independent of the listening, the educational skills and everything else of uh, the, the observer. So you've got a standard method to do it and it's very simple to do. We've done it to make it so simple that you know my uh, six-year-old grandson enters the data for me on some days. So you go here and you get going. So you click on get going. And the way we do it is, and you could say, oh, we, we could take the data from Merlin, everybody records on Merlin, and press a button and it uploads it. But that takes out the educational fun of it and the engagement. And I feel that my grandson's learned 20 bird calls from uh, doing this, and he knows 100 birds that he can punch uh, the data in. And we're matching icons on the phone with icons on the site. So we come to my site here. This is the, the only form you fill it in. You fill it in once, unless you have want to do it at two sites. And Brian's actually got three sites, but you can go and do this. And so I just sort of, if I, once you've done it, fill this in, I go uh, pick and enter it. It puts my pin number in automatically. And then I say, I want to go to site number one. If I click submit here, uh, it fills the data in and so on. So then after that, all I have to do is fill in uh, the date. We'll come back to this, but let me show you the type of data that are being collected. And you, what we're really focused on here isn't to you know, say, we've finished this. We want your input of how you might use this with your students, what analytical tools you would want. So do you want to combine three sites or 10 sites or 20 sites? Or, or or do you want to compare two? So, I mean, there's, there's things that we can do. So if I click on site list here, these are the, uh, this is the summary from this one site at my place, which is my back deck, my house. So I've got 134 species. I've done 18,000 identifications. I've, I've done 24,000 minutes, so many recordings over 407 days now. And these are the icons of the birds. And you can uh, you can say, okay, that's very interesting, but I can do search by dates here. And so once you set up a site and you enter your birds, you uh, you basically get uh, input input of uh, these are the birds I've got this year. Sorry. Uh, and I can then say, okay, show me their rank. And if I click here, it then shows me for these birds that my northern cardinal I've recorded 552 times. The tufted titmouse is the next most common. You can go down all the way down to these singletons, which are sometimes questionable, sometimes absolutely, you know, I've, I've definitely got, for example, a, a, a Cooper's hawk. It, 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 it calls and so on. And you can then say, okay, I want my June data. And so I've got the June data, and these are the ranks of the June data. And then I can say, okay, what did I get yesterday? Uh, and I got 24 species of yesterday. Uh, I did uh, three recordings and I got the Carolina Wren three times and an old Cardinal and so on three times. So you can go around and I can compare that with last June here. And I could say, okay, June 14th there, uh, it would be uh, this. And I, uh, I've got, these are the birds there. So you, you've got these data. They're publicly available, they're easy to uh, look at, but the idea is you've got these icons you're playing with and so on. And then we've got some analytical tools. Well, let me take you back here. And if I go uh, recording list, these are, uh, so, sounds ridiculous. These are the icons of the 18,000 uh, recordings, 18,000 birds here, just so you get, the data are there, they're available and so on. You've got the input form you go to. So basically what we want to do, uh, let me go back to listen here. And I, we want to ask you, if you had a class and you said to them, okay guys, we want to get make a site list for our school or make our site list for our school district. And you can then have these, uh, your students go out there they come, you know, uh, two students every day to the schoolyard and record the birds at the schoolyard over the 30-day period for a month. Or you could do uh, 
they all go back to their house and record their birds and you could compare their house birds with your schoolyard birds or with the other uh, uh, students and so on. So uh, we want to know that. We've got some things I want to show you here. If we do seasonal differences here, these are graphs that we can, we can make and we can make this so it's of your sites or so on. So this is comparing the number of birds in a recording. So this is minutes of recording over a day and you you can see that May, which is uh, there's generally more birds as the migrants come through. I'm going to flip it now to to Brian and just say we've got this tool. It's free. We would like to know what you would like to do with it or how you could incorporate it in your classes. And then we will customize the analytical capabilities so your students can make a graph or a histogram or whatever to compare sites or combine sites and say, okay, if we combine all the sites, we've got these species. And if we uh, we have certain sites, so for example, at my site, I've got pileated woodpeckers I'm very proud of. I've got turkeys I'm very proud of. I've got uh, scarlet tanagers and oven birds, which are interesting. I have very few house sparrows and starlings. So we can compare these. And the idea ultimately is we will be able to say, okay, these sites are the ones that are doing well and why. And there's the, the main thing I, I, I would like to do is compare what's going on in Florida with what's going on in other parts of the country. Florida and lots of the South now spray 16 million acres. Florida gets six to eight million acres with an organic phosphate called NALED, which is sprayed from planes, uh, C-130s and so on, to uh, control mosquitoes and mosquito abatement. This chemical floats down, it kills all arthropods for the most part. And if you lose your arthropods, you lose your birds. So if you go to Florida, vast swaths of Florida have no birds, but we don't have the data, it's anecdotal. I mean, I go down to Florida and go, why there's no birds? Oh, and there's no moths, by the way. And another guy goes down to uh, Miami and says, well, there's no bees here. And I'm sure it's this massive amount of chemical spraying that's going on there. Nothing to do with climate change at all. It's about chemical spraying. And we need to prove that and then ring the alarm bells and say, hey, guys, you know, my birds in Georgia are doing well. You know, the birds in you know Gainesville, Florida aren't because Alachua County uh, has a mosquito abatement that you know, is spraying mosquitoes left and right. And they did it for Zika virus and Zika virus has gone away. And now they said, oh, what do we do with our spray program? Oh, well, aim it at a black salt marsh mosquitoes. And it's just a money-making scheme of pollution. Anyway, that's me, Brian, over to you. Thank you. Do you want me to unshare my screen? Yeah, stop sharing. Okay. That good? So I'm going to, let me share my screen. Some of this will be a little bit repetitive, just in case people missed it the first time or um, came on, on later. But what I want to share just quickly, and then we want to really, as Pick was mentioning, turn it over to you. We want to get some ideas of, of how people might be able to use this, what features, what things they might like to do. Uh, so as you saw with, with Pick's work, he's been doing this for over a year. Um, he is extremely dedicated. He gets up every morning and records for at least a half an hour. So he, and he's down in Georgia where it's, it's warm year round or at least warmer than in, in Michigan where I'm at. Um, so he has a tremendous amount of data. Um, he's tested it out with different uh, phones and different systems to record the birds, but really it, it works well with pretty much any smartphone. If you download the Merlin app um, and, and you record the birds, you, I am I am not a good birder by ear. I can see a bird and I visually can identify many of them, but I've always had a hard time distinguishing all but about a half a dozen birds. But regardless, you don't need to know anything about that. This the app is is phenomenal and it keeps getting better um, as they do more development. So for students, or in in this probably would be older students that that can have access to a smartphone or perhaps younger students who um, can work with uh, an adult to do this or the teachers do it at school. There's, there's perhaps different ways of, of collecting data. 
Um, but once it's collected in Merlin, and we'll talk about that a little bit, um, you go into the Listen website, and I'm I use my this email. You click submit, and as Pick mentioned, I um, I have his site set up, but I have um, three sites in one of the big wood lots. Um, on Michigan State University's campus. It's about an 80 acre woodlot. And then the rest of campus is sort of a suburban grass. I mean, it's a beautiful campus, but, but no large patches of woods. And I'm not quite as dedicated as Pick. So I go out and get data at sunrise. A lot of birds will sing the most uh, at sunrise, but there are birds that sing at different times of day. Um, and I go out and record for 10 minutes at each of these three sites uh, in Baker Woodlot. They're about a five to 10 minute walk apart. So I get a nice kind of exercise in the morning. Um, and you can see I've only been doing this for about three months, just a couple of days a week. So I have a total of 20 days of recorded, uh, 10 minutes a piece, so 200 total minutes. And at this first site, number seven, I've recorded 54 species. Um, and these are the ones here. If you're not good with pictures, you can show the names, right? You can look at the recording list. And so you can see down at the bottom here, I started on April 11th. Sunrise at that time was around 7 a.m. And I recorded these birds. Um, my last recording was the 13th Tuesday, um, closer to 6 a.m. And you can kind of see a list of, of the types of, of birds I've gotten, okay? And as um, Pick mentioned, you can, can show by rank. So my most common birds I got at this site are a Northern Cardinal. Every time I've gone out, I've heard a Cardinal. Most of the time I hear Robins, talk to Titmouse, and so on and so forth, okay? So I just want to show you this because this is this is one site that I've recorded 10 minutes at a time for just one, two, three mornings a week. Right? You don't have to do this for hours and hours a day or or every day. You can still get a lot of data. And if you think about these data, and I've done it for three sites. So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to share a different screen. I'm going to share the PowerPoint, All right? So this is just the website again. Um, and, and then what I've done is I pulled out the data for each of my three sites to kind of give you a snapshot of what, if you're collecting data, your students are collecting data, what the listen website right now provides and what students could have access to to be, to be able to ask research questions um, about the birds that are are in their area so you just saw this this these were the 54 species the 200 minutes um, that I collected down in the lower left it shows it with the names in the ranks and then on the right is that, that list of 20 different dates. And you can see that the, you know, some dates there are fewer birds that are recorded, other dates there are more, um, but consistently there's somewhere, you know, 10 to um, 18 or so uh, birds. If I go to this, if it works, if I go to the second site, site number eight, I only found 54 species there, okay? Again, robins and cardinals and chickadees and titmice are, are some of the most common, but you can see at this site on some days, I mean, I only had three birds call in 10 minutes. A couple of days ago, I only had four call. So just this site, even though it's in the same woodlot, about a five minute walk away has different birds calling than the first site. And then this is the, the third site, only 42 species. So even fewer species have been recorded at this particular site, right? So as a scientist, 
when I look at this, I'm looking for patterns and what might explain the pattern. And, and what I want to do, the work that I'm doing with, with teachers in Michigan, um, is we're trying to develop curricula that allows any student to sort of use these tools and ask questions that they can then answer um, based on real data and real research. Not, you know, the opposite of this is kind of like telling a student, um, you know, we're going to test, do plants need light to grow? And we're going to take one plant and put it under a box and one in the light, right? Yes, they're going to collect data on how fast those plants grow and how long it takes them to die, but they're not going, that, that's something we already know. We know the answer of what's going to happen there. If you send your student um, out to a park, to your school ground, um, to their home, and they record birds, we don't know what they're going to get. We don't know, we have good ideas, but, but they're going to find data that are real and meaningful to them because they're collecting it and no one else knows what those, those data are. So when I'm looking at this, I look for patterns, right? Like, can you see this? This is a red-eyed vireo. Um, the Merlin app kind of ranks Kind of the the intensity of birds, like the most common or most abundant bird calls that it that it recorded. So this is telling me that on these days the vireo was sort of the most vocal out in this site. Um, cardinals were kind of next, titmouse here, um, but you can kind of look down here, right? You don't see any red-eyed vireos. There's one here, right? That's because red-eyed vireos are a migrant. They were down in John's neck of the woods, down in Georgia <laughs> at this point, and then they came up and now they're, they're calling. Likewise, if you look at these data, I, just visually looking at them, I can see a bunch of goldfinches. No goldfinches up there. They're still here, right? But they're busy nesting, trying to stay silent, maybe not attracting predators to their, their young. I'm not, you know, don't exactly know, but there's clear patterns in the data. And so if you actually pull these data out and you had students, let's say you only had 10 students collecting data, um, but you could have more, right? And you had 10 different sites they're collecting data at. Just aligning these things, you can start to ask questions. Well, at this site, the top five birds were cardinal, robin, titmouse, nuthatch, red-bellied woodpecker. Okay, this one, robin, cardinal, titmouse, but blue jay and chickadee. Titmouse, cardinal, robin, chickadee, and that red-eyed vireo. Like, why is that? What is it about those birds that make them so common, right? Or here's one of Pick's favorite, right? The pileated woodpecker. I got one at this site. I got two at site seven. And did I get one at this one? I don't, oh, I got two at this site, right? So they're there, but they're not common. There might be questions that students have. Why, why is that the case? What makes a good site for a pileated woodpecker or other types of, of woodpeckers, right? Same way, if we look at those kind of site lists, so I took off the dates, but this was at the bottom is, are the first dates. And at the top is the last date I collected. Again, you can see this pattern of vireos picking up. But I, I told you one of the patterns was goldfinches stopped singing about this time. Well, at this site, same thing happened. At this site, it happened. There's one that, that called up here, right? But students could pick and choose. I really like cardinals, right? What's going on with cardinals? I really like scarlet tanagers. These beautiful red birds with with black wings when do they first show up right here's the first one there there are none before that because they're they're a migrant so there's just lots of data um, that students can collect and pretty easily um, start to ask questions that i don't know the answer to um, you probably don't know the answer to and and they can actually conduct conduct real research 
So what I want to do with the, the last, we have about 15 minutes left in the session is, is Pick and I, we really want to hear from you about how you could use this with, with your students. Um, what questions do you have? What challenges might you have? Um, and so I just, I just listed a few of these real quickly. Um, you know, first, like, what, do you have problems with student use of phones? Um, is there an issue with the time of day? If you're, you know, do you have a morning class or afternoon classes? Um, what types of habitats do your students have access to? Can they go out and record on your school grounds? Um, do they have access to parks or other, other areas that they could do comparisons with? Um, this, this works in any habitat, right? If you're in an urban city, you're going to have pigeons, rock doves, you might have raptors, you might have falcons or other things that they have nesting. You're, you're going to hear birds, maybe not as many, but what types of habitats do you have available? And then when you think about the analyses, right? A lot of the NGSS standards and things, they want students to be able to work with data um, and, and produce uh, results and explain what's happening and also explain what impacts humans are having uh, on that that environment or that that feature. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over uh, to everyone else um, if you are willing to um, yeah, just jump on in or raise your hand or or whatnot. Julie has her hand raised, and we have a few questions in the chat too. So Julie, how about you 